that's when for me, the movie sort of started to not make sense and started to fall off a cliff for me. And here's why. Here's why I have so many issues with this cobweb movie. Hey, what's going on everybody? Welcome back guys, Justin here. As always, thanks for stopping by and hanging out with me today. Today we're gonna to be talking about cobweb. I couldn't stay away, I couldn't keep out of the cobwebs. I've been hearing good things about this movie and I want to support as many horror movies, as many movies in general as I can in the theater. And while everybody's buzzing about Oppenheimer and Barbie, I reviewed both of those movies. Not a lot has been said about cobweb, just a handful of reviews here and there. I love this cast, okay? I I'm a huge Lizzie Kaplan fan. Um, ever since I saw her in Hot tub time machine of all movies. I know she's done so many other movies, but that was the first thing I ever saw her in. I think she's great. She's got a great look. I love her voice. She has an interesting inflection and tone to her voice. Um, I think she's a versatile actress. She was in Mean Girls way back in the day. And uh, you also you have Homelander himself. What's his name? Anthony Starr. So the movie basically it centers around these two characters and their son as well as a teacher. Let's go ahead and dive into this because I have a lot of mixed feelings with this movie. A lot of it unfortunately do lean to the negative, but it isn't, my dog's licking my leg. But this movie isn't a total loss. There's a, there's a decent amount to like about this and a decent amount to, well, kind of be indifferent about. This movie tries to be a bunch of different things. Unfortunately, a lot of these things are things we've seen a thousand times before this movie feels fairly derivative, but that's not to say that there's not some fun moments here and there. It just feels like a retread of things we have seen before. I said to my buddy, it reminds me of those memes when you have like a kid asking their parents for something and they're like, we have that at home. It's like, you know, you have a kid in the car saying, I want to watch Malignant. Sweetie, we have Malignant at home. And this is the Malignant, this is like the wish version of Malignant. I don't know what I'm talking about here. Let's go ahead and dive into what this movie is about. This movie's directed by Samuel Bowden. This is his directorial debut. It's written by Chris Thomas Delvin, who wrote and gave us the infamous Texas Chainsaw Massacre, or Chainsaw, whatever the hell it was, the Netflix Texas Chainsaw Massacre, which I actually enjoyed. I thought it was a lot of fun. Try anything and you cancel, bro. This movie was part of the 2018 Blacklist. If you guys are familiar with the Blacklist, it's basically a collection of unproduced screenplays that I believe get voted on. I'm not sure how it works, but um, scripts are found there. There's been a lot of movies that have been produced from this Blacklist. Argo, American Hustle, Juno, uh, The King's Speech, Slumdog Millionaire, all these are Blacklist scripts, and this one, for some reason stood out to film executives, probably just because it would be cheap to film and horror is profitable. I'm not sure why this movie was released now. We'll talk a little bit about that later in the review. This movie was produced by Seth Rogen and Evan Goldberg. I'm sure you know who those two people are. Uh, Seth Rogen, of course, is Seth Rogen. <laughs> and his production, uh, and his pro producing partner, Evan Goldberg, that he gave us super bad and all these crazy movies. This movie was shot in 2020 in Bulgaria. I guess that's where they shoot all low budget horror films. You just go to Bulgaria and film your movie and then you put it on a streaming service. That's how it works. But this movie actually got a theatrical release, which I find interesting. I'm not quite sure why this movie was released now, especially going up against Barbie and Oppenheimer. This movie definitely feels like a fall movie. There's pumpkins, it's overcast, it takes place during Halloween. Um, it really captures the Halloween feel quite a bit, but let's talk about what this movie's about. This movie centers around a family, two parents and a son, and that's basically Basically it, there's a teacher character that pops in a little bit later in the movie, but basically you have sort of an ominous feeling inside this house. You have a little boy um, who seems to be troubled. He hears noises and tapping in his room and his parents seem to be almost like evil fairy tale characters. They're just like, mean and sort of uh, um, uh, 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 foreboding for no reason. You don't really know what's going on with these parents, but you feel, you get the impression that something isn't quite right with them. And like I said, they're overprotective of him. He goes to school and he draws these f***ed up pictures. Every cliche is thrown at the wall for this cobweb movie uh, until you reach that final act of even more cliches. There is some interesting things that happen, some good atmosphere, some good cinematography, some murky cinematography that happens in here. All the performances are, are interesting. The performances from Lizzie Kaplan and Anthony, whatever his name is, Homelander, are very strange. They seem almost stilted, but you can tell they've been directed to sort of act that way. That's another thing we're gonna come back to because I have an issue with that whole aspect of the movie. But what you, I guess we're gonna, God, do I wanna go full spoilers on this? We're gonna go full spoilers. This movie's been out, we're gonna go full spoilers. So you get this kid, he's living in this house, he seems unhappy, and he's troubled by 
things that he finds in the dark. He hears this tapping and eventually leads to voices, a young girl's voice in the wall, um, telling him that his parents have done horrible things. Earlier in the movie, it's explained that earlier, uh, years earlier, a girl that lived down the street uh, mysteriously disappeared and nobody knows what happened to him. And then due to the sort of strange way that these parents have acted, you sort of infer that maybe they know something or had something to do with it because of how ominous these parents are acting. And things come to a head when he finally, the little boy in this movie, has a conversation with the girl in the wall and you find out that this girl is in fact his sister, okay? And she begs to let him out. You, the, our parents are evil, I'm your sister, they threw me in the walls, what the fuck's going on? And when the parents find out that this daughter has been hidden in the walls, they they become furious, they become incensed with anger, they freak the f out. At one point, the kid actually tries to kill his parents due to the influence of this girl in the wall. But as soon as we get all these big reveals, we find out about the sister, we find out about the parents, that's when, for me, the movie sort of started to not make sense and started to fall off a cliff for me, and here's why. Here's why I have so many issues with this cobweb movie. Throughout the whole movie, you don't really know much about the parents, but you sense that they're very evil. They lock him in the basement. They're acting very strange. This teacher that's trying to find out what's going on with this little boy, she even stops by the house in a leather jacket, reminded me of Dangerous Minds or some shit. But everything in this movie, and especially how weird and fucked up these parents are acting, leads you to believe that they're going to be the enemy, and that's really the only thing you're left to feel because the movie makes you feel that way. So when you get this twist that the parents are in fact protecting society and their son from this fucked up demon daughter, it doesn't really make sense because it wasn't natural. You can't give a red herring like that and use that as your twist. You can't consistently pound into the head of your audience that you, these people are evil just for the sake of the twist. It doesn't work that way. You can leave clues, you can leave breadcrumbs, but a misdirection that's such a red herring to me feels dishonest and it feels like weak writing because then you can make anything a twist. If you make things a fact to the audience and then twist that fact around, that's not a twist. That's just cheap misdirection. At least it was for me. I'm really curious to hear what you guys think about that because to me, it felt very cheap. So you find out after he's killed his dad and after his mom goes crazy and all this shit that they really were just trying to protect them. But there's so many crazy manipulations that the director and the writing give you. That scene in the yard where the kid digs up the skull and his dad's in the corner being crazy. It's like, the parents have to be crazy at that point. If you're going to make the parents act that crazy, you're going to make them seem that evil, you're gonna put this ominous camera filter on them, they're gonna make Lizzie Kaplan act like a weirdo psycho then that has to be the case, okay? At least in my opinion. When you flip it, it just doesn't work. That's not a twist. That's not a red herring. It's just a, a cheap misdirect. And then we have the whole deal dealing with the daughter, and that's kind of where I have my biggest issues with this movie. At no point in time do they ever explain that this daughter has any supernatural ability, but, she can climb walls like she's got sticky fingers, like she's Spider-Man. She can rip people in half at a moment's notice and do it effortlessly. She can decapitate kids. She can fly at speeds. She can do all this crazy shit. She has a face that's beyond deformity. It's pure demonic. And in no way, shape, or form can this be explained. The actions, the abilities, the look, the appearance, the hair, everything about this character, in no way it can be explained in a way that wouldn't be supernatural. The only evidence that we get is this little, it's just like malignant. Eventually you get this speech from this girl in the wall that's explains when I was born, I was so ugly, my parents had to throw me in the wall. But you, my brother, were the perfect, beautiful child, blah, 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 blah. So there's no indication that this kid is anything but just a deformed weirdo murderer kid. There's nothing included in this movie that would give the impression that she's supernatural, but she clearly is. Now, they tease a sequel at the end of this movie that I don't think anybody is interested in. I, I didn't have anything but indifference at the end of this movie. Uh, I certainly have indifference about a sequel, but the misdirect of the parents and the seemingly supernatural nature of this daughter just made the movie not work for me completely. 
It's interesting and it's fun at times and there's some suspenseful moments with the bullies and some of the basement stuff and of course you want to find out. That's what keeps you interested all the way to the end. You want to find out what the hell's going on with this daughter but once it's explained it just does not make sense. From the misdirect of the parents being evil but then they're not evil but then they're kind of evil because they act weird and then the revelation that this daughter is supposedly just a mentally handicapped like evil child like a bad seed but she's more than a bad seed. She's a demon. She's got powers. She's supernatural. The, one of the first kills that she does in the house, you see a kid pulled effortlessly underneath the piano and explode like instantly into gallons and gallons and gallons of blood. A normal child or kid or however old this person is supposed to be would not have the ability to do that if it wasn't supernatural. So maybe they're saving something for a sequel, but there's even another scene where this body of this seeming like 140, 150 pound kid is raised up and lifted up and thrown around like a rag doll and a child or a teen or however old this person is supposed to be couldn't do that. And another issue I have with this movie, and it's a silly thing, but it's just another example of, of clunky writing. And that's, and that's this daughter's hair. Her hair is what you see going around the corners before they reveal the face of this person. All you see is this crazy hair slithering like a snake throughout the house and over the couch. If this chick can take her spiky fingers and decapitate people and explode them into shit, couldn't she have given herself a goddamn haircut? Now I know I'm bitching about something stupid, but to me it would be annoying to have 40 foot long hair to drag around a house or in the walls or whatever the fuck this bitch is doing. Just cut the fucking hair off, huh? I don't know. Am I the only person that had a problem with her not cutting her own hair? <sighs> anyway, so to close this thing out, I, I am not sure, first of all, I'm not sure why they've had the confidence in this movie to release it up against Oppenheimer and Barbie. That was a mistake. This movie, to its credit, has a really convincing fall feel and it would have been a much better vibe for even late September or early September leading into October. I imagine you wouldn't want to put this up against huge October releases, but this is a seasonal movie um, and it feels seasonal. And to that, I, I did. I, that was one aspect of the film that I did like. It makes no sense that this, that this movie was released in July. Um, this movie was shot in 2020. I don't know what the delay is. I tried to do some research on this movie to find out what the delay was. Was it pushed? But if you waited three years to put this movie out, why not just wait a few more months and put it out in the holiday, or not holiday season, the Halloween season. That's when it makes sense. You've already, it's been three years since this movie, <laughs> near three and a half years since it was filmed. Just wait a couple more uh, months and put this thing out in Halloween season. It would have been a much better fit. But as it goes, I can't say that I would recommend, I don't know, this is tough. I want people to go to the movies, but this movie seems much more suited for a Hulu or a Paramount Plus rather than a theatrical movie. But if you just need a light, don't want to think about anything, forget everything for an hour and a half, silly little horror movie, sure, go see this one. But I think a lot of people are going to be dissatisfied with this. I'm surprised actually that I'm seeing as many positive reviews for this movie that I am because it just seems so extremely derivative. Um, everything about this movie uh, we've all seen a thousand times before. Uh, the jump scares, the creepy crab walk. Yes, there's a crab walk in this movie. The long creepy hair, the person inside a wall. Like everything about this movie is a cliche. So uh, I'm not sure why this movie stood out on the blacklist. I'm not sure why um, it was pushed and then released up against Barbie and Oppenheimer. I, I don't really get it, but I wanted to talk about it because it is a horror movie that not many people are talking about it that you can go see in the theaters. I, I always encourage people to go and support the films uh, in, that you want to see in the theaters. It's good for good for business. We want to see more movies in the theaters. So I saw this on a matinee for five bucks at Cinemark. So if you have a five dollar ticket, I'm a member of the Cinemark Club, so I get discounts and stuff like that too. But um, if you need a, a cheap a uh, little thrill, a little afternoon outing, and you want to go see a little horror movie, Cobweb's fine. It's harmless, but it's derivative, and it's not giving us anything an original. I don't think we'll see a sequel to this. If we do, I imagine it would go straight to streaming, but I think we're done here, guys. That's all I have to say about this movie. Definitely let me know in the comments below what you thought of Cobweb. Anyway, guys, I think we're done here. Stay weird. Remember to always be yourself, and I will see you in the next one. Bye.